after the fifth piece of coconut, but Fred went on eating. Washed up on the beach just below Selkie's Rock were two purple caps with ridiculous fish on top. That's an easier way to call Galileo, said Nim, and picked them up. Behind the caps was a big piece of driftwood, and under the driftwood was a torn piece of fishing net. Nim and Jack hated fishing nets, but the raft, said Nim. The net was torn, too jagged to make one big bag, but she could cut four squares and make two smaller rafts instead. The net cord was tough and slippery. After a few cuts, Nim had... Nim had to get her sharpening stone, drawing her pocket knife across it the way Jack had taught her, one side and then the other, faster and again till sparks flew and the blade was smooth and fine. The sun, the sun said it was long past lunchtime when she finished cutting. Her knee hurt too much to go up to the vegetable garden, so she ate the last banana with some limpets and seaweed from Shell Beach and drank the juice from a coconut because there was no water left either. Then, sitting in the shade of a palm tree, she knotted the squares down the side and across the bottom. She flicked the net, knot and pull, and Fred peekabooed from side to side. Selkie grabbed the end of the net in her teeth and tugged. It's not easy working on something when a sea lion is playing tug of war with the other end. It took a long time to finish the two bags, then a long sore limp to Keyhole Cave. Selkie and Fred jumped in to help fish out the coconuts, which would have been more helpful if they hadn't kept playing coconut football instead. Stop being stupid, Nim screamed. Fred sank to the bottom and hid behind a giant clam. Selkie humped onto the reef with her back to Nim. Nim, feeling smaller than the limpet she'd eaten for lunch, crawled up beside her. I'm sorry, she whispered. Selkie could never stay angry for long, but Fred could. Nim had to dive three times before she could coax him back up. When she had all the coconuts on the rocks, Nim loaded ten into each bag and tied knots across the top so they couldn't escape. The sun was low over the sea by the time she dumped the second bag back into the cove and climbed on top. The first three times she tried, the bag raft ended up on top of her instead of the other way around. The fourth time, Nim won. She lay on her stomach and Fred rode on her back. She paddled once right she paddled once right around the cove, but she was in more of a floating mood today, and the raft was good at that too. But not with the sea line on top. Selkie thumped onto the other side and sank straight to the bottom. Try both together, said Nim, trying not to laugh. Nim held the raft and Selkie hauled herself on top. She floated across the cove, nosing herself off the shore and bumping from reef to rock. She liked it so much she forgot to tease Fred. She could have played there all night, but... Sun's nearly set, said Nim. Email time. From jack.rousseau at explorer.net to aka at incognito.net. Date. Wednesday the 7th of April, 1825. Dear Alex Rover, this morning I found an old fishing net, so I made two rafts because I thought it would be easier than one big one. There are lots of fun they are lots of fun to ride. Selkie liked them so much she barked till her throat was sore. In Keyhole Cove I could ride sitting up, but it's easier lying down, especially if your hero was out at sea with a big wave. Fred and I rode together, and the raft floated so well we would have been dry if we hadn't got so wet getting on. Fred's not very heavy. Selkie needed two rafts, or she sank to the bottom. She's a bit heavier than Jack, so if your hero is about that big, he could float on a raft with 20 coconuts. If I'd known that, I would have made just one big raft, after all, because Selkie sometimes slipped down the middle, and I had to hold the rafts together for her to get on. But I guess your hero wouldn't bounce as much as Selkie. From Nim. From aka at incognito.net to jack.russo at explorer.net, Wednesday the 7th of April, 1329. Dear Nim, Robinson Crusoe couldn't have been better. I'll stop worrying about how my hero could swim to the island if he was tied up in a sack. He can do exactly what you've done, though he'll find a piece of net just the right size for one big bag so he won't have to fall down the middle like poor Selkie. 
Here's the scene. He's gasping on the beach and realises that he's lying on a fishing net. And as he sits up, he's nearly bonked on the head by a falling coconut. Phew, that was close, he thinks. Then, aha! And he makes his raft and paddles bravely out to sea to defeat the bad guys. Which reminds me, how did your game work out? Yours, Alex. Alex waited, but Nim didn't answer. She turned the internet and the laptop off and was already asleep. What kind of dog weighs more than a man? Alex wondered. Selkie must be huge, and Fred must be a dog too. I can't imagine a cat riding a raft. She stared out the window. From the 41st floor, she could see a long way, but no, ma no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't see Keyhole Cove or a hero on a coconut raft. And just for a moment, Alex wished that she could be a person who did things instead of writing them, who could sail across seas or live happily on top of a tropical island. But Alexandra Rover was a dreamer, not a doer. She was stuck in a place like a train on a track, as much as a part of the city as the post office steps. In the morning, Nim's knee was hotter and fatter, with red lines streaking round the ooze. She didn't want to walk anywhere or do anything, but she had no water to drink and no food to eat. So Fred climbed onto her shoulder, she pulled her wagon slowly up to the veg vegetable garden. She filled her bottles from the waterfall, cut off a bunch of bananas and picked some strawberries and rode back down the hill. Selkie huffed anxiously. I'll feel better after a swim, Nim said. So they swam round to Turtle Beach. Chica was grazing for seaweed, but she stopped to play a very lazy game of coconut football, though it was more like catch because nobody could be bothered to wrestle for the nut. The tide was going out, and when they'd finished the game, Nim lay on her stomach and dug for clams with an old shell, while Selkie and Fred galumphed around the wet sand and Chica watched and nodded. When she'd scooped out enough for dinner, Nim made a fire, baked her clams and split a coconut for dessert. Fred darted his nose under her arm and nearly got bopped on the head with a coconut-breaking rock. Get out the way, you greedy dragon, she teased, and broke him off a piece. Shining there, like a perfect surprise, was a round, creamy pearl. Nim stared, not wanting to touch or move it. Jack had told her that sometimes, once in a lifetime or so, a coconut could make a pearl just the way an oyster did. But Nim had never seen one before. Fred finished his coconut, snapped, and the pearl disappeared. Nim felt as if everything good in her life had disappeared too. She knew it wasn't true and she knew it was silly, but she cried till her shirt was soggy and her breath was hiccupy and the tears didn't know how to stop. Fred sat staring with his mouth full of coconut and pearl. Selkie whumped on, on the back, well, whumped him on the back with a flipper and chunks of coconut and pearl flew out of his mouth. Nim gave one last hiccup and took the pearl back to the hut. It was even more beautiful when it was clean, more wonderful than shells gleaming inside whirls because it was a because it was whole and perfect. A lucky pearl, Nim whispered, because anything so rare must be lucky and to be beautiful and rare must be luckiest of all. She put it on a piece of stroked, smooth driftwood in front of her mother's picture and since it was nearly sunset now, anyway, turned on the laptop. The light glowed on the, and the computer hummed, but just as she clicked the email box, the screen went black. She'd forgotten to charge the battery. The pearl didn't seem so lucky when she couldn't tell Alex Rover about it. Chapter 10 The next morning, the red lines and the yellow ooze, angrier and pussier than the day before, were back on Nim's knee. Her body was warm and her head was as fat as a floaty, head was as fat and as floaty as a cloud. The solar panel was okay. The laptop battery was charging. The other charts and chores didn't seem to matter. She didn't feel like breakfast. But Selkie fussed until she had a glass of water and a banana. Galileo swooped past, chasing a bobby bird with a fish in its beak. Another letter was sticking out of his band. Thank you, Tropo Taurus, said Nim, grabbing the paper as Galileo snatched the fish cap from her hand. Dear Nim, Great news. Your fix-it father has got a fixed-up rudder and I'm on my way home. Plankton celebrated too, but on a great show, put on a great show last night and I discovered a new species of dinoflagellates, protozoan zooplankton. It doesn't look exactly like you, but I named it after you anyway. Protozoan nymph. 
The wind's against me, but it doesn't. But if it doesn't get worse, I'll be home tomorrow night or the day after. Love as much as Big Plankton, love Little Plankton, Jack. Nim knew she ought to be happy and ought to write a letter back, but her knee hurt too much to care, and she needed advice faster than Galileo could bring it. She dozed beside Selkie, and when she was too hot, went back to the hut. The battery was charged. Just for a moment, she wondered if Alex Rover still wanted to write to her now. The rafts were finished, but there was no one else to ask. From jack.russo at explorer.net to aka at incognito.net. Date, Friday the 9th of April, 10.48. Dear Alex Rover, I'm sorry I couldn't write yesterday because I forgot to do the science stuff so the battery wasn't strong enough to turn on the email. What would your hero do if he cut his knee when he climbed Fire Mountain? And now it has red lines and yellow gunk and his head feels hot and cloudy. Also, does your hero get lonely and miserable when he's on the island and the lady hero is with the bad guys? And even if he finds a coconut pearl, it doesn't seem as pretty because there's no one to share it with. Because Selkie and Fred don't care about things like that, except when Fred tries to eat it, but that doesn't count. From Nim. Alex had woken long before daylight with the story dancing in her mind like images from a film. She saw swaying palms and hot gold sand, a shimmering waterfall and grumbling volcano, clear blue and a cloudless sky. As the sun came up, she looked out at the dawn grey roof and railway, she, and she put on the CD, Seabird's Song and Dolphin Duets. Just like being by the sea, the blurb claimed. <laughs> Not quite, said Alex, turning on the computer. She read Nim's email, and she turned quite pale. It can't be true she said. A kid can't be all by herself on the island. She read it again. Then she printed out all of Nim's other emails and read them again and she looked on the map she'd drawn. She read Nim's email about climbing Fire Mountain and when the island looked like what and what the island looked like and realised that Nim never ever mentioned another person. If one true thing has happened in my life, said Alex, this is it. From aka at incognito.net to jack.russo at explorer.net. Friday the 9th of April, 5.55. Dear Nim, If my hero's knee was very swollen and sore, he would soak it in the sea and then clean it up with fresh coconut juice and bandage it. Then he'd rest in the shade and drink lots of water. And if he felt lonely and miserable, he'd tell someone, maybe in an email, that's what girl heroes on real island should do. Are you alone? Where are your parents? Do you need help? Love, Alex. Nim read the letter fast and turned off the computer. Her knee still hurt, but it didn't seem as bad now she knew what to do. She took her blue water bottle down to the beach and sat in the shade of rock with her leg in water. Selkie sat on one side and worried and Fred sat on the other and slept and Nim sipped her water and dreamed in the middle. When she woke up, she was stiff and sore, and the sun was going down. I've been here all day, said Nim, and she didn't know if Alex Rover's hero would have been sat there that long, but she liked the way her head felt as it belonged to her again. Then she took a clean hanky from the hut and punched a hole in a coconut and wiped the yellow pus and slimy muck away from her knee, and now the knee was sore, but not hot and fat. She turned on the laptop and read Alex Rover's letter again. Oh, said Nim, and felt pink and happy, because if Alex Rover wanted to come and rescue her, then he really must be a hero. But like the newspaper story said, even if she didn't need to be rescued. From jack.russo at explorer.net to aka at incognito.net. Date, Friday the 9th of April, 1826. Dear Alex Rover, my mother went to investigate the contents of a blue whale's stomach when I was a baby, but some bad guys frightened the whale and she hasn't been seen since. Jack is studying plankton. He went away for three days, except his rudder got broken in a storm, and so did his satellite dish, but he sent me a message with Galileo the frigate bird to say he'll be home soon. Soon might be tomorrow or the day after. I'm not alone because Fred and Selkie are here and so is Chica, so I don't really need help because I wash my knee like you said and it feels so much better. I'm happy that you're really your hero because I always knew you were. From Nim. But when she turned off the laptop, 
she didn't feel quite so bright and brave. So instead of going to bed, they all went down to Turtle Beach and sat together till the full moon shone silver on the waves. Chica, could le Chica would leave soon to wander the world's oceans for another year. But you'll come back next spring, won't you? said Nim. Because it was hard to think of Chica leaving too, when Jack wasn't home yet, and Alex didn't need to rescue her. Chica nodded sleepily. And maybe then, Nim said, Alex will come and meet you too. Chapter 11 It's a nightmare, Alex groaned, keying in travel agents in the internet search engine. She's alone on an island and nobody knows about it except me, who's been afraid of aeroplanes and oceans since my uncle whirled me through the air and into a swimming pool. I like being in my apartment, she moaned, clicking on... Pacific charter flights with my books and my computers and my imaginary pe my imaginary friends people who live in my head and go away when I put their stories away places that fit into maps and pictures animals that don't smell or eat or leave hair on the carpet there's only one thing to do she said clicking back on her email from aka at incognito.net to jack.russo at explorer.net Friday the 9th of April, 1352. Dear Nim, all my heroes are just pretend. Real people aren't usually as brave or as strong or smart or lucky as the heroes in my story. Or maybe that's why it's fun to make them up and read about them. Because I'm not tall, dark and handsome. I'm certainly not brave and I'm not a man. But even if I'm not a hero, you don't need rescuing. I'd still love to come and see you and the island. And of course, Fred and Selkie and Chica. What kind of dog is Selkie? I'm guessing that she's a Saint Bernard, if she weighs more than your father. And Fred's a little poodle? Love, Alex. P.S. My phone number is 155-897-346. What's yours? The letter waited all the next day till Nim checked her email. She stared at the screen. She read the letter out loud and the words stayed the same. She turned the computer off and ripped out the plug, but the words danced in her head. Alex Rover was not a hero. Alex Rover was a woman and she wasn't even brave. Outside, the evening was peaceful and still, but inside, Nim was a rage hotter than fire mountains lava and wilder than a whirlpool in a, st in a storm. She felt angry and treated, chick tricked and stupid, lost and lonely, sad and confused. And the feelings were stronger than the word the words could say. They jostled and shoved and spun and crowded and exploded. Her shout rang across the water, birds settling for the night flapped into the sky, and the king roared an answer from Sea Lion Point. Selkie, barking worried, worriedly, lolloped across the sand. Fred peered from under his rock. Nim was afraid that if she used the laptop, she'd punch the keys right through the keyboard. She grabbed a piece of paper and a pencil and marched back outside. To Alex Rover, it was horrible to trick me, even if you didn't mean to, because whenever I was really lonely or scared or bored, I thought about what you would do, and then I could do it too, which was stupid if you're not a hero. And I wish I'd never done it, and I especially wish I'd never, ever wished that you were my father instead of Jack. I will never forgive you. Goodbye forever, from Nim. Scrabbling in the dark, she found sticks and branches for a fire, and when it was blazing, threw her letter on top so that the smoke could carry it far away, far away to wherever Alex Rover lived, and she would smell it and know just how angry Nim was. Selkie and Fred crept up beside her. Alex Rover lied to me, Nim told them, and threw another stick on the fire. Selkie barked low in her chest. Well, not exactly lied, Nim muttered as she rubbed tears on Selkie's warm fur, warm fur. But she's not a hero. I thought I knew who Alex Rover was. He was my friend. And now he's gone. Selkie grunted comfortingly. You won't change into something else, will you? Nim asked, not sure whether she was joking or not. I won't wake up tomorrow and find out you're a mermaid. Selkie grunted again a little louder. Alex thinks you're a Saint Bernard. And she thinks Fred's a poodle. She must be crazy. Suddenly she began to giggle. She thought you were dogs. And I thought she was a hero. 
The giggle became laughter and the laughter became a bellow and she was rolling over and over on the sand, hiccuping and laughing or crying. She didn't know which until Fred sneezed and Selkie barked to make her stop, whichever it was. And she knew there was another reason that she'd sent the letter in a way that Alex couldn't read. So when the sun came up the next morning, she turned on her laptop again. From jack.russo at explorer.net to aka at incognito.net. Date, Sunday the 11th of April, 6.45. Dear Alex Rover, maybe you didn't try and trick me. I wanted to know someone brave, because I'm not. I think maybe I accidentally tricked you too. Selkie and Fred aren't dogs. But you will like them. When are you coming? From Nim. From aka at incognito.net to jack.russo at explorer.net. Date, Sunday the 11th of April, 1.46. Dear Nim, now, love Alex. For two nights and two days, Alex had been planning, sorting, packing. Her time had switched to island time. She slept when it was night there and got up when it was dark to turn on her computer at the island's dorm. She refused to think about what she'd do if Nim said no, because she didn't quite believe that Nim had stopped being lonely, and she didn't quite know if Jack would be home soon. And because nothing in her life had ever been this important, she packed a first aid kit, her laptop and a mobile phone, two notebooks, two pens, the Swiss Family Robinson and Robinson Crusoe, a toothbrush, hairbrush and soap, two t-shirts, two pairs of shorts, one pair of jeans, one jumper, three sets of underwear and socks, and the map with the island marked with dots. Then she picked up her suitcase and locked the door behind her.